Welcome to Small Arms Solutions. Today's crime series is number seven, and today we're looking at the Charter Arms Undercover. Now, this is a revolver that, uh, as much as it was used by criminals, it was also used by law enforcement as an undercover pistol. This pistol, uh, is inexpensive as it was, has a very large uh, piece in history of, of current uh, handgun designs. So talking a little bit about the designer, this gentleman's name was Dennis McClellahan. He was a designer for Colt, High Standard, and Ruger. While at Ruger, he designed the Ruger Police Service 6. Now, the gun that he went to design for the Charter Arms, he established his own company in 1964 uh, called Charter Arms. And the revolver that he designed, as we see here as the undercover, was very revolutionary in two major ways. First off, this was the first revolver to ever use what's referred to as the transfer bar safety. We're going to be seeing several pictures uh, coming up of what the transfer bar safety looks like. But traditionally, revolvers, due to the fact that if they were dropped, just the inertia from the strike on the hammer was enough to set the cartridges off. What the transfer bar safety was, it was located in the back of the receiver. Where here's what we have is the transfer bar safety right here. What happens is, is, is this position, when the trigger is not pulled, is in the upward position, and you have a shelf which is located on the, on the hammer. If the trigger was not pulled, that transfer bar safety would engage, and it would block the forward movement of the hammer. Where if the trigger was pulled, it would be pulled down out of the way, so when the hammer would strike, the shelf would be able to strike the firing pin and set the cartridge off. Basically, what this did was it made the first revolver that was drop safe. There's physically no way possible uh, by dropping this revolver that it was going to go off. You physically had to pull the trigger all the way to the rear to make this gun fire. This would be transferred over to many major manufacturers, Smith & Wesson, Ruger, uh, to name a few. Uh, it would be this new standard and safety of all revolvers. Also, what made this thing special was the fact that it was a one-piece receiver. All the internals were inserted from the bottom rather than from the side. There was no side plate, and what that did was it made the revolver much lighter and also a little bit more durable because it would not shoot itself apart as much with the screws that were holding the side plates. Those were the major design features of it was the model frame as well as the transfer bar safety. The revolver was also designed around what was referred to as Supervel ammunition back in those days. Supervel ammunition was more of a plus P type cartridge which was a little bit higher of a pressure. Due to the recoil of the Supervel ammunition uh, there was a significant recoil and what happens if you didn't have a proper crimp on your 38 special rounds, the rounds that were on the side, the bolts would work their way out forward. And because you have the forcing comb, which is the gap in between the, the barrel and the cylinder, uh, you had a little bit of a gap there. If that bullet was to slightly jump out of that cartridge case, it would cause it so the cylinder could not rotate and would lock the gun up. You'd have to take it and disassemble it for it to be able to get those rounds out of there because you would have that round that would block it. So you'd have a, a really good crimp on that ammunition. Now, five rounds of 30 special, this is what's referred to as a belly gun. You have to be up close to use it. Uh, we're talking within seven yards. Uh, there's no rear sight per se um, that's adjustable. You have just a, a, a groove in the, in the frame and you have a blade front sight. Um, these came in several different finishes, different grips and, and so on and so forth. This is a traditional one that goes back to the, to those, uh, to the, to the 1960s. This is where it was referred to as a Saturday night special, uh, but it was not an imported one. Uh, law enforcement has seen these quite a bit. Uh, but before we get a little bit more into the law enforcement aspect of it, uh, we're going to take this out to the range. We're going to see how it shoots. Now, overall, uh, we only fired maybe 12, 15, 12 to 16 rounds out of this or so. Uh, I wanted to thank Brandon over at the gun room uh, at Shenandoah. Uh, he has been able to provide me with all kinds of these crime guns, so we were able to take a look at them. Um, as I said, when we are up close, it does what it's supposed to do. Uh, it'll put it within the center of the center mass of a target, uh, which is what it was designed to do. For law enforcement, then, this was used by a lot of law enforcement as a backup pistol, not as a primary. Uh, it was small. It was small as could fit in an ankle holster. Um, it was relatively light. Uh, it was reliable. Uh, it served very well for for law enforcement for that for that purpose back in you know in the seventies and the eighties. Due to the fact this pistol was so small and was so light, you did have a lot of recoil when you would fire it. That's just you know lightweight, uh, heavier caliber. That's just what happens. But again, due to the fact that you were close up, it didn't really matter. Now this was a very popular pistol back in those days as a, as a carry concealed. There's well over one million of them that were made. Now, for as far as these used in crime, these, uh, due to the fact any weapon that was inexpensive, uh, generally was very appealing to criminals. There was a couple of very high-profile crimes this was used in, such as the assassination in 1972 of Governor George Wallace. 
and also uh, was used to murder John Lennon. It definitely had some high-profile cases. In the crime lab, we saw quite a few of these because they were they were they were definitely a gun of choice. These were very very often received with serial numbers that were removed, uh, and most of the time, the criminals fortunately did not know how to correctly remove a serial number, so they couldn't be restored. We had a, an extremely uh, you know high high success rate at restoring these serial numbers. And you know, when law enforcement runs serial numbers, what does that do for you? Basically, all it does is it gives you a track uh, so the many from the manufacturer tell you what distributor it went to. That distributor can tell you what dealer it went to, and that dealer can tell you who the initial point of sale was. That's about as good as it's going to get. Once that gun is either sold from the from the first owner or it's stolen, unfortunately, that serial number retracing doesn't really do much use to you at all. So, you know, we see a lot of current things are looking at trying to do for 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 guns, uh, such as putting serial numbers on firing pins, so having micro stamping and so on and so forth. As much as it tells you, it doesn't tell you much. Again, it tells you that initial point of sale. Uh, but as far other than that, it's useless. Uh, it doesn't really tell an investigator you know, who the, whose gun the hand was in uh, when a crime was committed. And that's the whole thing. We may know that this gun was used in certain crimes, but we, without being able to put it in somebody's hand and have witnesses and so forth, all the investigation that tells us this was the gun doesn't really do us a lot of good in court. Uh, the end result is uh, a forensic firearm examiner, we could tell you this was the gun that fired these bullets, but we couldn't tell you whose hand the gun was in. That was a job of the DA. Now, talking about uh, modern crime laboratories and how things are done now, revolvers are quite different uh, than some automatic pistols. Uh, when you look at the IVA systems or the uh, digital databases that are used, they're used for fire cartridge cases. Well, revolvers do not leave cartridge cases at the scene because you physically have to open it up and, and eject, eject. Many of your crimes where you're only having you know two, three, four shots uh, with a semi-automatic pistol, it leaves evidence behind, it leaves cartridge cases behind uh, as a suspect would flee. So taking those images and putting them into the IBIS systems or the NIBIN systems and creating a digital database that way, it gives you a very accurate uh, and very consistent record of what guns are used and what crimes. Revolvers, you don't have that. Revolvers, basically what you have are projectiles. And the digital databases that we use, uh, whether it was the drug fire of the past or it's the, the new, you know, the IBIS system that we use now, even though they do have provisions to enter bullets and to, and to do that, it's not very good uh, due to the fact that a lot of bullets you would have fragments uh, they don't take very good images of. So that leads to what's referred to as an open case file. Crime laboratories, uh, it's not common anymore, uh, but in the past, you would have digital, you would have a basically an open case file where you would have a cabinet full of bullets. And in that, and in that, you would have them separated by their general rifling characteristics, whether it would be um, the direction of twist, five right, the caliber, the diameter, the projectile. So, say you would have a five five uh, lands groove right hand twist. Now we have an entire series of firearms that would fire that, and then from there we go down to the the width of the lands and grooves, and that would narrow it down. So you would have a bolt that would come in from a. Uh, a crime scene or a homicide, and you would take that bullet, you would measure it, you would match up those general rifling characteristics, and you would go to that open case file, and on the microscope, you would physically have to go through each and every one. You would have your crime bullet on one part of the microscope, and then you would have your, um, you know, the other bullets that you're comparing to on the left side. Very tedious, very time-consuming, um, and that really is not done much anymore. Uh, for the most part, most crime laboratories do not keep that open case file any longer. If they have reason to believe that two crimes were put to, were, were related, you would have the crime number and you would call that evidence back in and then you would look at it uh, through investigative leads. You wouldn't just have a blanket, you know, we're, we're going to go through an open case file and try and find a bullet. And I can tell you from my experience working in two crime laboratories, we did not have an open case file for projectiles uh, in the Wisconsin crime laboratory. We were way too busy uh, and it wasn't effective at all. The Crown Laboratory in New York that we had, um, we had an open case file for bullets. It was extremely inefficient. Uh, it was a complete waste of time. Very rarely did we ever get cold hits. But the way that our leadership was at that crime laboratory, they kept it, uh, even though it was against the, you know, the uh, suggestions of other people in the crime laboratories, because it was it was a waste of time. But uh, revolvers. Um, because they don't leave the cartridge cases at the scenes, so they don't generally they don't go into the IVA system, so you can't track them as well. Uh, for the open case file, um, you know, depending on your crime laboratory, um, you don't have that. And with the amount of gun crimes you have in major cities, it's impossible to have those open case files. Open case files like that, you generally have to have an investigative lead that would tell you that you needed to go and uh, and look at that additional case and call that evidence back. But uh, revolvers such as this, um, you know, we did see some of the little Colts, and we saw some of the, you know, the, the worst ones we ever saw were the Roms and things like that. We would see the cheap stuff, but sometimes there was a branch over between 
the crime guns that we would see and those same guns used in law enforcement, at some point we're going to be looking at Glocks as a, in the crime series because Glocks are were used by bad guys as much as they were used by law enforcement. Um, many manufacturers uh, who their marketing, their sales is all geared towards law enforcement. You know, we're the, we're the gun of the, of the of law enforcement, law and order. They have a commercial market, and anytime you have a commercial market, those guns can end up in the hands of uh, of of the bad guys. And each of those guns has specific characteristics that we would look for that would help identify those as being that type of a gun. So at some point, we will be looking at Glock as a crime gun, and we'll talk about what we would see um, in, in, in forensics uh, looking at those types of firearms. Um, you know, this little gun here, uh, this is uh, in pretty good shape for as old as it was. Um, you know, I have a little story, you know, growing up, there was a, a really close friend of, a friend of the family who had one. And um, when he bought the gun, he was told that uh, just don't target you with it, it won't last. Well, uh, at 15, 16 years old, I was reloading ammunition and I was shooting with Ray and he had his little charger arms undercover. And we put, or he put, you know, several thousand rounds over probably a five, six year time period. He liked to go shooting with it and the gun never came loose. Uh, the gun always held together. You may, you may have to tighten up some screws once and again, but the gun pretty much did hold together. So overall, uh, we have a very common crime gun here. We also have a very uh, common uh, law enforcement gun. We have a gun that was also very revolutionary uh, in the evolution of the safety of revolvers. The first gun to use the most common uh, safety system that we have on revolvers today, transfer bar safety. Also, with a one-piece mono uh, receiver, you've eliminated a lot of parts. You've made more durable by having it, so you don't have a side plate that comes off. So this gun had quite a bit. The designer of this gun, he worked for some very prestigious companies. When you look at Colt and you look at uh, uh, Ruger and you look at High Standard, you're looking at some very you know, high-profile uh, manufacturers, some of the best that were in the industry. So you know, for him to go out and open his own business and to take that talent and to make something at somebody at a gun that was somebody who consider a lower quality, and this would become parts of this standard on all of the best you know, revolvers that we're going to have made in the industry. So I hope you all did enjoy this video. If you do, please click like, please subscribe, and even better, share. Thank you.